one of so half of my half of my PhD research was actually on butyrate. Half of my my PhD thesis was like two hundred and thirty eight pages or two hundred and thirty seven pages, and I think the the latter like one hundred and thirteen pages were all are on all on butyrate. So I know butyrate. You and I both share that love and the passion for butyrate. Do you want to explain it a little bit? I know you talk about it in the book, but I think it's just an interesting topic that I think people don't know enough about, or they hear short chain fatty acid and they don't necessarily know it. But at least if you kind of give a little primer to it, people will know what to expect in, in part of your book. Well, let me say this, and I know that you can appreciate this, Frank. I, if I had my way, would have written at least double, if not triple, the number of pages about short chain fatty acids. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the, but the problem is, like, you can't write a, a book for public consumption that you just nerd out entirely about the science of yeah. something that I consider to be wildly overlooked. And so the story here is this, that fiber doesn't just go in the mouth and come out the other end. Fiber is actually, at least certain types of fiber, the soluble fiber, is consumed by the microbes that live inside of us. And that's their food. Mm -hmm. So the food that, the, 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 the parts of our diet that are able to you know, survive digestion and not be absorbed in our small intestine, they make it to the large intestine, the colon, where these microbes live. And they basically get into a feeding frenzy and they eat it. That is what makes fiber prebiotic. And when they eat it, these microbes, they get stronger, they multiply, and then they want to pay us back. And the way that they pay us back is by transforming the fiber, basically restructuring it and changing it into what are called short chain fatty acids. And the ones that we're referring to are butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And you don't need to know the differences between these three. That's like extremely high level stuff that most doctors don't know. Yeah. But um, what's key to know is that these short chain fatty acids are incredibly healing and healing in ways that are mind blowing and fascinating because for example, if you take the idea of dysbiosis, where some people will refer to this on the internet as leaky gut, I know that this is not something that we like to call it, but you know, we're talking about intest we're talking about dysbiosis, damage to the gut microbiome, which includes breakdown of the epithelial layer, the wall around the colon, breaking down the cells and opening them up, and that allows toxins to sneak into the bloodstream. And you want to fix that. This is the solution, short chain fatty acids. In the book I lay out in chapter three how they can reverse each step that's involved in dysbiosis. Now, Frank, I was talking uh, this morning with the Scherzeis. Mm -hmm. So for the, the listeners on our call right now, Dean and Aisha Scherzei are the authors of the book, The Alzheimer's Solution. They're, they're incredible neurologists. And I am convinced that the blood brain barrier is functionally the same as the blood gut barrier in that it's the tight junctions that keep everything together. And butyrate repairs that too. Re butyrate repairs the tight junctions in the brain too. So the healing effects involve the gut, butyrate also, and these short chain fatty, fatty acids are capable of affecting your immune system, which is very relevant these days. They affect cholesterol. Um, our insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, they affect our weight balance and our satiety after a meal. Um, they actually can spread throughout the entire body. And as I said, they can go all the way up to the brain and they can affect neurologic function. So these are healing molecules that have huge effects throughout the entire body that are anti-inflammatory. And if you believe that inflammation is at the root of disease, which most people do, then we should be striving to get more of these. And that is where the problem lies, which is that we haven't been talking about these. We've been talking about lectins and gluten and all these things that, frankly, we're, we're blowing out of proportion. And really what we need is we need to instead be focusing on where am I going to get my fiber from? Because fiber is what gives us the short chain fatty acids. Yeah. And one thing I think most people don't realize is like when you think about different different macronutrients, right? You want to think about which macronutrients and what they're going to do for your body. Most people know protein is going to be good to build up your muscles. Most people know that sugar is going to allow your, your cells to fuel themselves and to generate ATP and to be used for energy. Most people don't realize though that 
butyrate, which, you know, is that short chain fatty acid that comes from eating fiber. Most people don't realize that the colonocytes, the cells that, that line your colon, they actually use butyrate for energy production. Like yep. that's their, that's their primary source of energy production. So without that right. butyrate, without that fiber, the cells of your colon just don't have the primary source of energy that they need to be able to, to do their functioning properly, which I think to me, it's just mind blowing that it's actually from fiber that our, our cells energy attract, get their energy from. There's uh, and I, for the 117 people who are here with us right now, I hope you guys don't mind me nerding out for a moment because I'm talking to my friend who I think yeah. we, we love to nerd out. So, yeah. but there is a researcher at the university of Michigan. Um, his mm -hmm. name is Eric Martins. And he has been studying the effects of fiber on the epithelial layer. And he's looked specifically at the mucus, at the mucus lining. And what he's found is that when you go on a low fiber diet over the course of about four weeks, you will thin out that mucus lining yeah. and it's um, disastrous for essentially the gut and the health of the, of the gut. Well, we, two of my other topics that I wanted to talk about on my list was one was leaky gut. And I think we'll come back to that in a second. Cause I have a, one question, but I want to, I want to hit the next one. And that was actually uh, the mucosal layer. Cause so there's, there's this weird, I call it like a symbiotic relationship and it's the relationship between fiber, what fiber does between the colonocytes and the goblet cells that produce mucus and then also saturated fat, right? If you're cutting out a lot of the, the fiber from your diet, you're going to probably be taking in more fat, right? Most people, that's kind of the, the, the trade-off that they get with cutting out fiber. They in, intake their fat intake. And saturated fat has been shown to reduce mucus production. So it's interesting that it's kind of there's two-prong effect of maybe why that mucus production is lower, um, based off of the saturated fat and the fiber differences. I don't know if you, if you talked about that or if you've ever done any research into that, but that to me is just fascinating. Well, I, and I think what it boils down to is this, you know, when we talk about stuff like that, it, um, it brings me back to one of my two favorite studies, which is Lawrence David et al from nature 2014. Mm -hmm. This is the diet diet rapidly and reproducibly alters the gut microbiome study. And for the people who are listening at home, this was where they took people and they put them on five days of either a completely whole food plant-based diet versus five days of a completely animal product diet, like meat, dairy, and eggs with no plants at all. And they looked to see what would happen to the gut microbiome. And in literally 24 hours, there were already radical changes to the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the changes that occurred in the animal-based diet, to me, they were disturbing. You know, you saw the emergence, no surprise, of the bacteria that thrive in an environment with bile. And these are almost uniformly inflammatory microbes. These are the types of microbes that produce secondary bile salts that, that cause colon cancer. These are the types of microbes that will produce TMAO associated with heart disease, stroke, chronic kidney disease. And one particular microbe that emerged dramatically in this study was biophila wadsworthia, Mm -hmm. which it has been strongly associated with the development of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the thing that I, was, I always think about with this study is because there was literally no, it was just all or nothing, 100% plants versus 100% animal products. The thing that I've always wondered is, is it the absence of fiber or is it the presence of saturated fat or both? And we have studies with fiber and we have studies with saturated fat, and it leads me to believe that it's uh, it is both that saturated fat. Not only is it it's not that it's net neutral; it's that the saturated fat in animal products and full disclosure, coconut, coconut oil, coconut milk, um, that the saturated fat actually is inflicting harm on the gut microbiome. And we do have some animal model studies to support that. Yeah. And then obviously the opposite is true, which is that fiber is nourishing to the gut microbiome and what it needs to thrive and survive. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's probably the most important part is people need to realize that it is that two pronged approach. Cause we have studies that show that it's both, it's not just one way or the other. So let's talk a little bit about leaky gut because leaky to gut to me, that's in your book. That was one of the first keywords I looked up. Cause so what I, what I did is I went through your book, kind of the whole thing. And then I went back to look up keywords, key phrases, try to figure out, you know, what are the hot topics? What, what are you saying about it? Because leaky gut is an interesting thing that I think you as a gastroenterolo gastroenterologist knows that, you know, it's not something clinically that we discuss. It's not something that the medical profession as a whole wants to discuss or agrees with. 
but on a on a research side of it, taking the clinical side out of it, me as a researcher, I can measure OCTN2. I can measure the tight junctions or, or the different the, the proteins that bind cells in your gut and say, hey, there is a change here, right? So why don't you kind of give me your opinion about it or what's the permitting of the profession versus you versus the research? And I'll kind of maybe chime in with some of my, uh, my opinions or, or some of the things that I've seen on the research. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the we are in a place now where we're there, there is no gold standard test for dysbiosis. Mm-hmm. Okay. And researchers, they know it when they see it. Um, so, you know, globally speaking, it's this idea of a loss of diversity and the emergence of, you know, what we would characterize as inflammatory microbes and the diminished presence of the anti-inflammatory microbes. So that's sort of where it starts from a... Um, uh, bacterial or like a microbial population's perspective. And what you end up seeing is then there's the breakdown of the tight junctions, um, which uh, leads to increased intestinal permeability. Now, like, do I believe that there are any, any tests, whether it's microbiome tests or intestinal permeability tests that are ready for clinical use? No, I do not. Yeah, yeah. I do not. I mean, they, I think, they've, they've tried that with like the mannitol lactose ones and stuff like that, but still, yeah, I'm with you on that. And, and so I, I think that where we're at is, this is the way that I feel about it. I, I think that there is no question that it, this exists, okay? I have never seen a study, by the way, Frank, and correct me if you, if you have, but I've never seen a study where a person had increased intestinal permeability in the absence of the alterations of the microbes. Meaning that, meaning that I think that increased intestinal permeability in leaky gut is not in isolation. Instead, that inc- increase in intestinal permeability and leaky gut is a part of the entire phenotype, the complex of dysbiosis. Yeah, no, and, I'm I, 100% I agree with you because the one part that I was going to bring up at the end, and you already kind of brought it up in this, is that there's, it's not just whether the, it's not just the cells. You have to think about the whole environment, the bacteria, and also the, as we mentioned earlier, the mucosa layer. You could have the same, in my opinion, this is just personally, this is, this is going more on the research side and less on the clinical side, because I'll leave that to you. On the research side is I think about the aspect of if you look at the tight junctions, if you look at cells on the epithelial layer, you could have the same cells, the same, you know, the, I would say the structural integrity in one, in one, you know, colon with a really good mucosa layer. And that mucosa layer is going to buffer any of the harsh impact of anything that's coming against it, or you could have the same, you know, in structural integrity of the, of the epithelial layer and then have no mucus that's not being buffered at all. So it really is kind mm. of the whole ecosystem. And, yeah. you know, you can't just say that it's, Oh, it's just that, but you know, it's just the, the tight junctions or the cells are, are letting things leak through. It's no, you got to look at the microbiome. You have to look at the mucosal layer. You have to look at the protective effects that what dietary components are in the GI tract that could be causing harm or, or feeding, the local environment. So yeah, I agree completely with you that it's, it's that entire dysbiosis versus, versus entire environment that you have to look at there. Yeah. And I, and I think too, one of the other things that you will commonly p- see, like, so when we're looking at the entire environment, you know, we, we should include the metabolic products of these microbes. Mm-hmm. And that's where to me, shotgun sequencing is such a superior test to the old fashioned way of doing things mm-hmm. because it allows us to look into that. And, you know, to me, one of the keys here is that when they think about a healthy microbiome, that includes a microbiome, not just in terms of the bacteria capable of producing short chain fatty acids, but the actual presence, the actual presence of short chain fatty acids, which are having their effect within that environment, you know, actively. And, and it's all um, intertwined in a way where when you eat fiber, you will initiate this process like a snowball of getting more microbes that are capable of producing short chain fatty acids, which then creates a feedback loop uh, where you just keep ramping up and getting more and more of these microbes and there's increased efficiency so that the person who basically is constantly consuming a predominantly plant-based diet has a microbiome developed for that diet that is going to continue to produce maximum amounts of short chain fatty acids to heal and have anti-inflammatory effects throughout the body. And this is where for me, you know, this is, this is more than just, because the problem with many of the alternative dietary choices is that there are things about the ketogenic diet that in the short term are like indisputable. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? And and there there are things about it that if you're looking at it through the proper lens, through certain lenses, you look at it and say, wow, that's appealing. That's a that's a good metabolic effect or or whatever it may be, okay? And I'm not disputing those things in the short term. But here's the question. This is the real question. What is the diet that gives you the benefit in the short term and will actually keep you healthy when you're 50, 60, 70? Going to give you that health as you age, going to protect you from heart disease, the number one killer, going to protect you from cancer, the number two killer. And the problem is that going high fat, high protein, low carb, and having very little dietary fiber is a setup for heart disease and cancer. Yeah, no, I, that's the one of the most important things is I think we can nerd out on the science of, oh, what's the mucosal layer doing versus this bacteria versus that bacteria, but it all comes down to what's your fiber intake, how much fiber are you consuming, and then what is the total nutritional uh, makeup of your dietary choices. It doesn't have to be 100% whole food plant-based to get the maximal benefit, right? There, There is probably a degree of, of gray in the middle, but it's really important to point out that without these foods, without the foods high in fiber, you're not going to get the benefits that you need from the short chain fatty acids and, and the motility, you know, how fiber affects motility and everything. So I think that that's the important part that a lot of times we, or me as a scientist, I just, I just get, I get lost in the details and forget that big picture wise. It's let's just keep eating the fiber. Well, and that's, and this is where there's layers to the evidence and we like seeing all the layers pointing in the same direction. And when you look, think about fiber, we see it, we see it in our you know, basic science studies. We see it in our animal model studies. We see it in human microbiome studies. We see it on, in systematic reviews and meta-analyses of population-based studies. All levels point to the same thing, which is that fiber heals and fiber is good for our body. So a, a, a person who stands, I mean, look, the internet, people, I, I want people to understand that um, the internet, anyone, can claim to be an expert, right? Anyone can set up shop on the internet and say that they know what they're talking about. And at the end of the day, you need to make a decision on whether or not you believe that that's a legitimate source. Mm -hmm. In trades, in certain trades, states have put into place protections. Okay, now that those protections are meant to be for the consumer. You know, like the internet doesn't have these protections. But like, for example, I need to have a medical license in order to practice medicine. All right. And my medical board, if I do something crazy to protect the people of our community, will will potentially take my license away from me. Well, that I mean, that it brings up the part that just cracks me up is before your book and your understanding, like you already mentioned shotgun sequencing. I know you understand micro, microbial sequencing and what it takes to actually look at someone's microbiome. Not only a patient's been doing a research or whether it's acute changes or, or longitudinal changes. But I can tell you that almost everyone that talks about the microbiome out there has never actually sequenced someone's microbiome, right? Like, and that right. part to me to just blows my mind. Is, I don't know if it's something you do in your practice or it's something you don't, but the fact that you know the difference between 16S RNA sequencing, you know the difference between you know, shotgun sequencing or metagenome sequencing, it just shows that you know, the level of care that you've taken to put into this book and your clinical expertise from your master's of clinical um, investigation, which I know you have, it really does make a big difference because all these other people that are talking about the microbiome who don't understand that, you know, when you sequence someone's microbiome, you're sequencing their stool. You're not sequencing their epithelial layer. You're not sequencing their small intestine. You're not a sequencing their stomach because each part of the GI tract in each location, you know, topography wise from the center of the colon to the to that epithelial cells, it has a different composition in the microbes. And that yeah. is a really important part that most people don't realize or have never done or, or may not understand that that is a big difference. Well, that's, and that's the real challenge that we have in terms of studying this is that I wish it was so simple as just getting stool specimens from everyone, you know? But that's, yeah. that's the challenge is that I think that there's geographic variability within mm -hmm. the, you know, and not just segmented. I mean, we think about it as anatomic segments. But I, I think certainly within the colon, there's geographic variability, and and they've shown this. They've shown this, you know, the variability in terms of the um, pH within the colon and different segments, and you know, for example, um, more distally in the colon, typically the fiber will actually be consumed by the time that the um, uh, feculent material gets down to the distal colon, 
And there, actually, it's the protein that's being used to, to create short-chain fatty acids and the distal form. So it's just fascinating. But it's hard to, hard to uh, study it you know, the way that we really need to, to fully separate. But I think the bottom line is this, Frank, is that I think that we know enough, mm-hmm. right? I think that we know, we're, not, we're not yet in a place where we have the specificity to analyze a, per, analyze a person's microbiome and use that information to tell them whether or not they're going to have Crohn's disease. Yeah, correct. Right? We just don't have that yet. But what we do have is this. We understand the basic biology and mechanisms of the microbiome. And that's really what my book is about, is about using the basics of our lifestyle, diet and lifestyle, to swing the pendulum in our favor and heal our microbiome. Because there's core concepts that we may implement in our own unique ways, like even though you and I eat a 100% whole food plant-based diet, you and I are not eating the exact same food on a daily basis. That's not a one size fits all. Those are mm-hmm. unique versions of a similar concept. Mm-hmm. And um, so, and I think that that's really to me what my book is about is showing people that there is this path to heal your gut um, that is clear at this point. And you just need to use the book as your compass to move towards healing your gut and where you choose to ultimately settle. like. You know, I don't know if you caught it in the back of the book, but I ultimately say, look, if you make yourself 90% plant-based, I got no argument from a health perspective. Yeah, I, correct. I honestly think that the strongest argument to go from 90 to 100, at that point, the strongest argument is actually animal welfare and the environment. And I think that there are legitimate arguments to be made and people should learn about those things. But if you get to 90%, I mean... You know, that's up to you. I, I personally think that you're going to feel so good at 90. You're going to go, why would I stop at 90 when I could go to 95? Yeah. You know, but that's just me. I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you. And that's the thing is I've been on a lot of other podcasts that are not plant-based specific podcasts. And I think that's the important part is that it's not a one size fits all. You don't need to go to that hundred percent necessarily. There are definitely benefits of going hundred percent, but getting to that 90% where you're incorporating as much plants And the diversity of plants, because we haven't even mentioned that, is that the diversity of plants in your diet is one of the most important things for microbial health and the microbial diversity, which is, you know, synonymous with gut health overall. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is where I get concerned about things like people, some people will do implement a ketogenic diet and they'll, they'll say, oh, we, we have learned our lesson through the couple of years of this fad that you need some fiber and so we're not going to count that fiber we're going to call it net carbs and we're going to remove the fiber okay well look i'll give it to you that's a step in the right direction but here's the issue it's not you know this it's not grams of fiber that predicts the health of the gut microbiome yeah it's the diversity and it's what percentage of your diet is made up of plant food Mm -hmm. which contains fiber relative to the other stuff. You know, if you think about everything as a scale, right now, the average American has 10% of their diet that is actual, real plant food, fruits, vegetables, whole grain seeds, nuts, and legumes. And 90% of their diet is either animal products or processed food. So that means 90% of their diet is destroying their microbiome. And that's where we need to flip the scale. Yeah. And have the the weight the weight of the balance being on the side that's actually protecting our gut and feeding it and nourishing it, yeah. right? There 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 is no accepted single greatest microbiome on the planet. If that existed, I think it would be me, my Delgado. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, true. Yeah, but I, I, there is no like I think that there's multiple forms of healthy, and the question is what is actually changing. When a person develops, say, your old bowel syndrome, mm-hmm. right? We know that the microbiome has changed, but what is it? And there may be different variations. I'm sure there are different yeah. variations of what's occurring in the microbiome. And that's part of probably what explains different variations on how we manifest. And, um, and we need the ability to first, I think, make the connection between clinical phenotype and microbiome findings. And then the next level is how do we adapt it to get it back to something that's closer to normal? And validating that within a population of people, you know, taking people with IBS and showing, because this is really where I'm like, look, like I saw some people who are asking questions in our little bar here about the GI map. And it's like, look, the, you can collect information 
and you can throw information at people. But if you never validate that information, then what's the use of it? Yeah, if you never, if you never demonstrate that you can improve health outcomes, what's the use of information that's pointless? So, and my um, mentor at UNC, Nick Shaheen, would say, people who order tests always, you know, they, um, what did he say? It was always, you get what you deserve when you order the test, is what he used to say. Because a lot of people will order tests, and then they'll get the results back, and they'll go, oh, crap, I don't know how to interpret this. Like, you know, what does this mean? And it's like, well, why did you order the test? Yeah, it's like, it's like when to and when not to order a D-dimer, right? It's like, right. well, you know, I mean, exactly. you, there's always those tests. But on the, on the science front, I, I would say that I'm a, a little different, at least on the value-ness of science. I think that there's some things that we definitely do in science that maybe aren't clinically relevant. But I think they're a building block that we need to do now so that in the future we can understand stuff. So, but I think on, on the clinical side of it, I think that's the difference that you see between, you know, a PhD versus, versus, versus an MD, the, the clinician side of it is that there's definitely research that I did that clinically we may not, it may not have any clinical implication, but can it be used for future relevant research? Absolutely. And so oh, that's totally that. Yeah. And that's, but that's the thing is you have to be tricky and, how you're discussing that research and saying what, you know, it's the difference of test tube experiments versus patient population experiments, right? Well, listen, Frank, it's always a pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. This is the book, guys, Fiber Field. And I wanted to tell you real quick that there was a, um, a section in the book, I think in chapter one, where I talk about serotonin and mm -hmm. I, I talk about the 5-HT precursors. And I want mm -hmm. you to know that when I wrote that sentence, I was thinking of you, my friend. Yes. When I wrote that yes. sentence. You have, you I, have made an impact. Yeah, the serotonin thing, don't get me started. I mean, I wrote a whole post on it and people got mad that I was telling them about serotonin. But yeah, that's a, I'm, I appreciate and ha thankful that you thought of me when you're writing that section of the book. You are correct. And I want you to know that I, I, please do not judge me when I say 90% of serotonin is in the gut. Because I will, I always try to go out of my way to say mm -hmm. that the serotonin does not cross the blood brain barrier. But some of the precursor molecules we do, we think do in fact cross the blood brain barrier, which is part of the reason why diet can affect mood. All right, I hope you guys got a lot out of that. I had a great time sitting down with Dr. B and discussing his book and some of the highlights from the book. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for coming.